Hello, my doom scribblers. So, my brand is about writing the unputdownable novel. And we have chosen to write books that follow the hero's journey because it's an arc that we can all understand. Somebody who is entirely unsuited to the task, is chosen for the task, and basically has to overcome themselves and change in order to accomplish this task, which as human beings is incredibly difficult for us to do, even at the micro level, not even the macro level. So this goes to the subconscious um, and is very rewarding for us to read about. We are also writing in close third. Why close third? Because close third is currently extremely popular uh, and the brain science behind it says that this is the most intimate, the most immediate, the most like being inside somebody else's head and being in the main protagonist's direct experience rather than outside that experience. And collectively, we have been working towards a common goal and in essence, a common voice. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is once we've got all of the chapters written to go through and start editing with an eye on other people's chapters. Um, this is not because I want you to homogenize the story or make it flat or, or make it just one note at all, but we can't have whiplash for the readers. We can't have tones that are so different that the reader thinks, was this written by different people? As I watch the different teams beginning to do this editing process, some are further along than others, and don't worry if you're not there yet, everybody is doing just fine. Um, what I'm seeing is that we've got everything from people who are entirely rewriting their early chapters in light of what they've learned since. And so, some of us have learned a lot, even the get rid of adverbs because adverbs are telling and don't use dialogue tags because if you're in close third, the chances of you telling a story that way and keeping it inside the mind and the experience of the main protagonist are really low if you use artifacts of storytelling like he said and she said. Um, even those tiny changes, plus filtering, um, they're quite big for your storytelling because you have been developing your own voice and your own method of storytelling. And for most people, close third is a new discipline. My hope is that even if you go back to your regular lives and you decide close third is really a discipline that does not appeal to me at all, you will at least have learned more about showing versus telling because close third requires you almost all the time to be in showing and not telling. So that's going to be something that you'll take away with you. The other thing that I'm noticing is um, the people who are not making those changes or who are saying things like, well, I'm going to take care of that in another book. And the answer is never to take care of it in another book. If your colleagues around you in your book, as you're editing, are giving you feedback that says that you're not in line with the group voice, you've got to do something about it. And if you don't do something about it, then I have to do something about it because this has to be a rewarding experience for our readers. Um, I, I'm also minded that coming at this with my background as a ghostwriter means that I am, um, I'm predisposed to think that this is easier perhaps than it is because I have a history of taking on other people's voices. Uh, and that actually goes to one of my misbeliefs. One of my misbeliefs was that in order to remain safe, one of the best things to do would be to mimic the people around me. Um, partly it comes from being an army brat and moving a lot and not having that base where that was home. Home was just wherever we landed. Um, 
but also you know being being sent to boarding school and being out of class literally strata class not class at school um meant that i i do things like i pick up accents from other people very very quickly um and i know how to hide in plain sight and they are survival mechanisms um without getting into too much of my my back history buy me a drink and i'll tell you the story um so so i come at do you want to write with another person from a ghostwriting background and for me taking on other people's voices was always a wonderful challenge and i i a little bit want to invite you to think about that as part of your literary practice as you are thinking about your voice and you are thinking about your career and you're thinking about your forward trajectory one of the things that makes a book or makes an author unputdownable is voice and voice is one of the very very hardest things to teach and one of the very very hardest things to understand because it feels quite nebulous but there are writers when you open a book it could only have been written by them nobody else could have written it um, there is nothing about it that is generic or flat or homogenized they don't use cliches we're going to start talking about cliches and we're going to start talking about um, metaphor and simile and we're going to talk about how you differentiate your voice from everybody else's voice as you go forward in this instance for the doom scribbler project you are having to give up a certain amount of your voice. You are having to give up a certain way of you telling a story because you might not be interested in the hero's journey going forward. But what I hope you're learning is as you do this and as you learn this as a discipline, later you can choose yes or no. Um, I, I, I've recommended this book before, Intuitive Editing. And, uh, and I was reading her section on voice. I really do recommend this book. Very, very excellent. Listen to this. I have a theory that each of us is wrestling with just a handful of specific big questions we spend our lives trying to find answers for. Do you know what yours are? Likely they infuse your writing subconsciously, whether you do or not. But identifying what your core issues are can often help define the themes that make up a big part of the voice of your writing. I find, for instance, that I'm constantly thinking about the meaning of family, not just of origin, but the families we make for ourselves from the people we choose to share our lives with, and not just partners and children, but also the friends we choose as family. I also wrangle, wrangle a lot with forgiveness and what it means, how to find it, even for egregious trespasses. Whether it's always possible or not, I don't know. And I tend to think in shades of grey, without absolute good or evil, but the ways in which individual perspectives define those judgments, to and about oneself and others. What are your themes? Do you know? If you aren't sure, and you've been writing long enough to have a body of work, whether published or not, see if you can identify the common threads running through your stories. Ask your crit partners and beta readers what they would define as the themes of your work. You can even ask your friends and loved ones how they see you, what they believe your driving questions are, what they believe are most important to you in the realm of ideas. Notice the kinds of stories you gravitate to reading and watching and see if you can identify commonalities among them. I am deeply drawn to stories about relationships, about flawed but decent people, to stories about foundational struggles with a message of hope. What are you drawn to? Try making a list of what you feel are the most important things you've learned about life and what you still need to know to learn, what you feel are life's highest values the meaning and purpose of life. All these methods will begin to paint a picture of who you are, what foundationally motivates you, what makes you you, and let you access what more deliberately in your writing frees your authentic voice. I like that a lot. I like this idea of there being foundational themes that drive you. Um, and I am 
definitely theme driven without question I am theme driven um, and I want to invite you into that conversation about what drives you um, in in the woo woo sense what are you here for as a storyteller I I've been um, bringing into the room people who are just watching this on the YouTube channel, you won't have seen some of the stuff that's in the room, but um, I took a quote from the blurb for Lisa Cron's latest book this week, uh, and she talks about what, um, what at the brain level works for story and what triggers us into unput down ability. Um, and I want to really, really expand on this idea of what for you is so compelling that you have to investigate it? Have to. Um, I promised at some point that I would tell this story because because uh, it's a great story. I was we lived in New York and we were making films at the time, and there was an actress and her girlfriend who we were friends with, and we went to see a film together. Um, I don't remember what the film was, The Young Poisonous Handbook, I think. Uh, and at some point in the corner of my eye, I saw her, her get up and leave. And I thought, oh, well, you know, she's gone to the bathroom. Um, and she didn't come back and she didn't come back and she didn't come back. And her girlfriend went looking for her. And, you know, I said something to Ginger like, whoa, that doesn't look good, does it? And I wondered, you know, maybe if she was... Um, uh, food poisoning, something that would take you out of a film. But we didn't really know them well enough for, for us to go out to a bathroom and find them. And so we left them. And, and she'd been in a couple of Ginger's films. Um, this actress and I had acted together. Uh, and we went upstairs. We took the escalators back up. And she was sitting in the lobby with her head between her hands. And as we walked up, I said, hey, Jenny. It wasn't her name, but I'm calling her Jenny because I'm kind so you can't look her up I said hey Jenny how are you doing and she looked up and her face was drawn and she said you know what Kate every time I'm around you I just want to vomit and I froze I absolutely froze and she said I've done some work and in a past life in the Spanish Inquisition, I mean, good God, what was going on in my head at that point? I'm like, nobody thinks so about the Spanish Inquisition. She said, during the Spanish Inquisition, you were my torturer. And seeing you makes me want to vomit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, think about why you're here. Think about what your goals are. Think about what you want to achieve as a writer what your message is as a writer and what your voice is as a writer. I, as you perhaps know, am obsessed with fairness. I'm obsessed with equality uh, and I'm obsessed with giving back. And that's possibly because in a previous life I was a torturer during the Spanish Inquisition. Good job, doom scribblers. <laughs>